Welcome to the weekly sermon podcast for the Wilmington, Ohio Church of Christ. We pray that this message will inspire you and help you grow closer to God in your faith. Be sure to stick around after the message to find out more about how you can take your next best step. Enjoy the message. Last week when Nick opened up our sermon series on uh, the, you know, sermons about hymns and teaching us what we're singing, he went over to the piano and played just a couple of notes of the song. And so I practiced really hard this week for our song today, Hark the Herald Angel Sing. And I played some for Nick. And he said, and I sang it for him. And he said, hmm, I, w- I would hate for that to be a distraction. So I practiced some more. And I played for my daughter. And she said, Dad, are you sure you got the right notes? So I think I'll stick to preaching. And whether I can play it or sing it or not, the world will never know. <laughs> But according to two musicians, I can't. Our song, Hark the Herald Angels, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, is the hymn we're going to focus on today. And the passage is from Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And here's what Luke chapter 2, 13 and 14 says. And if you wouldn't mind, would you read this out loud with me? And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Before we look at that text, would you mind if I pray for us? Lord, I thank you that uh, you call us to worship you and you call us to worship even with the angels, glorifying Jesus Christ, your son, sent to us, made savior for all who would believe. Lord, I'm also thankful that you uh, tell us, make a joyful noise. Lord, I can make a joyful noise to you. I'm so thankful and so awestruck by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, help me, help me, help me to present the gospel clearly today through the scripture. And Lord, allow this song... To, and the scripture that it's about to shape our hearts so that we would be more like Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hark the Herald Angels Sing was a song written by Charles Wesley in 1739. He wrote it as a, a part of a, a book of poems, and he wanted it read on Christmas Day. It had 10 stanzas. Several years later, a contemporary of his, George Whitfield, changed the words just a little bit where we have kind of what we sing today. And then it wasn't until 1880 or, 18, or somewhere around the 1880s that they put the song that we sing today, Hark the Herald, to music that we know it as. And so um, that song, though, is based on Luke chapter 2, talking about the arrival of Jesus Christ to us. And I believe that when we focus on Luke chapter 2, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 or open your Bible app to Luke chapter 2, I'll also have the scripture on the screen. But I believe that arrival of Jesus that Luke chapter 2 tells us about, the gospel Luke tells us about, um, it just changes how we see the world. The arrival of Jesus allows us to rejoice for, for three reasons, three reasons of change the arrival of Jesus brings. Number one, Jesus' arrival uh, makes Jesus, he makes God accessible to anyone. And number two, it, we, he is, he's available to anyone. He's accessible anywhere. And number three, this is really important. It's anyone and anywhere, but it's not any time. It's at once, at once. And we're going to look at how the scripture conveys that right now. Uh, Luke chapter two, if you would, if you would mind, I'll read uh, verses one. So you get the story. And then the This part of the story starts in verse 8, the part we're going to focus on for the song. I'll tell you when we get there. Now, in those days, excuse me. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, 
to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now here is where Hark the Herald Angels comes from, starting with this verse, verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. Now, this is the same night and the same region that Jesus is born. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began to say, saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which they had been told them about this Christ, this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as, just as had been told them. From that passage, I think the, the first thing we see is this arrival of Jesus is for anyone. And here's what I mean by that. It kind of, God is kind of reversing the order of how the world works. If you'll notice that Caesar, the king of Rome, called for a census. He's the king of Rome. And then the governor, Quirinius, he was over the area. And the angels did not go to the king of Rome or to the governor or to the rich people in the town. He went to the lowly shepherds in the field. This is not how the world operates. The world seems to always give favor to people who are wealthy, people who are well-to-do, and it seems to outcast those who are more lowly or those who do menial jobs or those who work for a living, right? The world works that way, and God is reversing the order of this, and he says, no, Jesus is for anyone. I love the fact that Jesus makes himself low so he can pick anyone else up. Jesus crossed the universe to come be with us. He left being praised continually in heaven to come to earth where people would reject him and cast him out. And then he wasn't born into Herod the Great's castle, and he wasn't born into Caesar Augustus, the king of Rome's realm. He was born to two peasant people. We know Mary and Joseph were poor because when they went to make the sacrifice of the temple for the birth of Jesus, they used the poor man's sacrifice. It wasn't a lamb. It was pigeons. It was was two birds. You could buy for like pennies. Jesus was born into a poor family. So poor that we have uh, created a whole nativity scene built around Jesus is in some kind of barn, laid in a feeding trough. Jesus came to the lowly. See, he made himself low so he could pick everybody else up. There isn't anyone too low that Jesus would not accept into his kingdom. And that's one of the themes of Luke's gospel Luke's theme is that Jesus is for the poor, the oppressed, and the outcast. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost, those who have been cast aside. And when he says lost here, lost means enemies with God. Can you imagine being an enemy with God? That's where sin puts us. When we think about sin and we hear that term sin, a, a lot of people think, well, it's just I've made a mistake. And there, there are several descriptor words for, used for sin in the scripture. Um, sin is one of them. It means to miss the mark. And so, yes, in a sense, we've all missed the mark and made a mistake. But there's another sin uh, a description called iniquity. And that's where you take something good God has given us and then you twist it and pervert it into some kind of idol. Some people I've heard do that with ice cream. 
like they'll have a little depressed moment and they'll go to the freezer and they'll look for strawberry ice cream in the drawer of the freezer and if it's not there, I, I know this person will go get in the car and drive to the Dollar General and go in and buy the ice cream to take it home and eat it to feel good about himself. I've heard somebody will do that sometimes. But iniquity is where we take something that God has given us as good and we twist it and it becomes our idol and that's what we seek satisfaction from instead of seeking satisfaction from God. And then there's that term transgression. Transgression is when we know the good we ought to do and we know the bad we shouldn't do and we don't want to do the bad we shouldn't do. We want to do the good that we want to do and then we go and do the bad we know we shouldn't do. That's rebellion. You see how the scripture sometimes says, because we've missed the mark and because we've twisted God's ways and because we've actually rebelled, like purposely rebelled against God, that makes us enemies with God. Lost. Outside of God's family, outside of God's mercy. We have a sin debt we cannot possibly pay and a sin sickness we no amount of ice cream can heal. And Jesus says, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. And for us outcasts, those who were enemies with God, Jesus, his arrival is for anyone. Even those who feel far from God and even those who have purposely made themselves far from God, Jesus' arrival is joyous because he invites us to be with him. Jesus' arrival means our relationship with God can be reconciled, healed, made whole, and we are invited to be part of his family. I know there are sometimes people who come and visit our church and they will say something like, man, I never imagined I'd come back into a church. Man, I really thought that God might strike me down if I came in the church doors. And they were invited by a friend and they were hand drug in by a friend and they get in and they realize, oh man, God doesn't want to strike me down. He wants to invite me in. See, Jesus' arrival means we can rejoice because the Savior is for anyone. Jesus, when he was talking with his disciples, getting ready to go to the cross, he says in John 15, chapter, chapter 15, verse 15, he says, No longer do I call you slaves, servants, for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. Well, how would we celebrate this? How would we celebrate the arrival of Jesus that it's for anyone, that he has come to save the lost and make us our relationship with God whole again, inviting us into the family, where Charles Wesley was struck by this. And he said, oh, we need to listen to how the whole universe sings the glory of God. And George Whitfield later changed it and he said, hey, Charles, maybe bring it down a little bit where us common people can understand it. Maybe just focus on the angels. And Whit Whitfield put in that line, the newborn king. And so the first verse of Hark the Herald is a description of what Jesus is doing with his arrival and what our response should be. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Listen, listen to what the angel messengers are singing. That's what Hark the Herald Angels sing me. His name is not Harold. It's a, it's a proclamation. It's a proclamation. Listen to the proclaimer about what God has done. Hark the herald. Angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. See, the arrival of Jesus means Jesus is is for anyone. But it also means Jesus, God, our relationship with him is accessible anywhere. Look at verse, uh, verse 9 here in Luke chapter 2. An angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And check this out. The glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, if you have read your Bibles and you've been to Sunday school, you would recognize that it is only a rare time that the glory of the Lord was shown outside of the temple in Jerusalem. 
God is everywhere. He knows all things. There's nowhere you can go to run or hide from him. You can't go to the highest mountain. He knows you there. If you go down to the deepest depths, he knows you there. He knows what you're thinking before you think it. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows your heart inside and out, and he, and he still wants you. He's everywhere, but he did set aside a certain place for people to worship. It's in Jerusalem, in the temple. And this is, this is why... There is a, I mean, one of the reasons why there's a war going on in Israel right now. The, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is a holy place for Muslims and Jews. And for Christians, it has historical significance. But God was revealing in the arrival of Jesus that the holy place is no longer going to be on that particular mountain, in that particular spot. The glory of the Lord showed up in the sheep barnyard. If the glory of the Lord can show up in the sheep barnyard, he can show up wherever you are. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how shepherds in their field would watch their sheep. They would be like the doorkeeper of their sheep, and they'd set up just a rock pen with no door, and then they'd sleep in the doorway just to keep the sheep at night and protect them. This is where the glory of the Lord is showing up. This is Jesus arriving and changing the place of worship. When Jesus met with the woman at the well in Samaria, he was revealing himself as the prophet Messiah to her, and she was coming to her senses about him, and she says, you know, Jesus, I I understand you're a prophet, and our father said we need to worship here in this mountain in Samaria, but you Jews say you have to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, believe me. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Jesus makes the, makes the glory of God accessible anywhere. Years ago, preacher Mike Bro, he started his sermon. He said, where is the most holy place on earth? And he started listing off these holy places. And he said, well, maybe it's the temple in Jerusalem. Because that is where God said all the people are supposed to go worship. That's where the Ark of the Covenant rested. That's where the Holy of Holies was. But the temple of, the temple's been destroyed since 70 AD. So I guess that can't be the holiest place on earth. And then he started listing all these places that might be holy. And he, he always came up with another reason why that place is not holy. Jesus tells us that if we put our faith in him, if we trust him, the scripture seems to indicate that if we are buried with Jesus and raised by faith into a new life in baptism, that God comes and makes his home within us. The Holy Spirit indwells us. Therefore, the holiest place on earth is wherever Christ followers are doing the will of God. Jesus' arrival, with the glory of God appearing to shepherds as they watched their flocks by night in the sheep barnyard, the glory of God in the Christ child in a manger, a feeding trough, shows us that the holy place has moved to wherever God is. And God says he wants to come and live within you. This is where Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, Nicodemus, tell, Nicodemus says, to, says to Jesus, Nicodemus was one of the teachers of Israel, and he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you have to be born again. Nicodemus is like, how can I go back and be a baby and be born again in my mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, no. You have to be born physically, but you also have to be born spiritually. And there's a process. When you put your faith in Jesus, he causes a rebirth to happen within you. Where he says, God the Father and I come to live within you. By the Holy Spirit. You know what this opens up? It means we can worship God anywhere. Yesterday, I worshiped 
and prayed about you today and the sermon I would preach now on my couch with my ice cream. (laughs) This morning, our prayer group, we met two buildings over in a little cramped room and prayed for you. Last week, I prayed in a dojo. A couple weeks before that, I was with school teachers where we were learning to pray at school. See, the arrival of Jesus means we get to pray anywhere. We get to worship anywhere. And if the glory of God can appear in a barnyard and with sheep animals, and he can come live inside of us, and he can indwell us, with anyone who calls on the name of the Lord being saved, if he can make himself available anywhere, and if that doesn't blow your mind, allow me to mention one other mystery about God that we just can't figure out, which is probably the hardest thing to believe about Christianity. (laughs) God himself made himself human. Listen. Listen. The creator of the universe. We can't even get to the, uh, we don't even know exactly how big it is, but it's big. We have uh, two satellites that were shot into space in the 70s that are still going and they haven't reached the end of anything. That God who names each star made himself a baby. He hid his glory behind his humanity. Tony Brockmeyer, our youth minister, Cheryl Brockmeyer, our children's minister, they have their grandson with them today. And uh, he's a chunker. He's awesome. And Tony, he's carrying him one arm. When Tony finishes, Tony's one arm is going to be this big and his other arm is going to be, because he's carrying that baby in one arm. Listen, even that beautiful, cute boy who's big for his age, could not fit the grandeur of God into his body. How in the world does Jesus do this? We call it the incarnation. God made flesh. And the first verse of Hark the Herald Angel scene kind of gives a description about this newborn king that all the angels are declaring, this is glorious. And the second verse kind of gives us a little bit of theology behind it. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, the incarnate deity. Pleased as man, with man to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us. We're singing real theology Where Jesus is described in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Jesus, who is equal with God, did not consider equality with God something to hang on to, but he humbled himself and made himself man. Scripture says we should all take that same attitude. And remember what Jesus did. He humbled himself and made himself low as a baby. He grew and was despised by men and made himself low as a slave. The Son of Man came to serve and not be served. And then he made himself low to even experience death. And then, even lower, death on a cross. That's only meant for the poor and outcast. Rich people, the wealthy, the kings didn't get put on a cross. And he made himself so low so he could lift everyone up. The arrival of Jesus is for anyone and it's for anywhere. And finally, anyone and anywhere, but not at any time. No, 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 no. It must be now. It must be at once. You must give your life to Christ now. The call of Jesus is urgent, urgent, urgent. Please, Don't mistake this nervous smile I have as it is so urgent that you make this decision for Jesus today. You do not know if you have tomorrow. 
I woke up this morning and checked the news feed and there was a tornado in Tennessee that killed six yesterday. They never saw it coming. We don't know. And we must choose Jesus now. The scripture says as long as it's today, you have the opportunity to turn to him. But if you don't have today, then you don't have the opportunity to turn to him. You must do it now. The greatest trick the devil will play on you, the greatest lie he will get you to believe is not that there's no God, not that there's no devil, it's that you have plenty of time. That's the greatest lie the devil can use to get you to delay and to delay and to delay making a commitment to Christ. The angel said to them, this is Luke chapter 2 verse 10, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people... For today, today, in the city of David, there's been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It's a warning as much as an announcement. Today is the day you need to give your life to Christ. In the Backstory podcast this past week, uh, Rich and Stephanie Cummins, they gave their testimony and they're members of our church and they serve and Tony Brockmeyer asked him, Rich, how did you come to faith? And he said, well, you know, I grew up kind of in a hellfire brimstone church, and I was scared of hell is why I turned to Jesus. And he said, I don't know that that's the greatest reason to turn to Jesus. It may not be the greatest reason. I don't think it is. I think the love of God is the greatest reason. But listen, being scared of hell, having the hell scared out of you to turn to Christ is a valid reason. And when Jesus came to earth, his call was always urgent. Turn from your life of sin and follow me. Sell everything you have and come follow me. And he described the kingdom of heaven like this. A man found a rich treasure in a field and he went and sold everything he had so he could come buy that field to have that treasure. That's how valuable it is to know Jesus Christ. And so Wesley, in in the song that he wrote, Hark the Herald, He connects the first coming of Jesus with the second coming of Jesus by quoting the prophet Malachi. See, Jesus, when he arrived, this newborn king, he came as a lamb. He came with nails in his hands. But the scripture is clear. When he comes back again to take us home, he's coming with a sword in his hand for judgment. And all those who are not in Christ will be cast into the lake of fire forever. One of my mentors, uh, Dr. Wallingford, he just has these types of conversations all the time with people. And he'll, he'll bump into people that he knows at, the, at a gas station. And he'll just start telling them, hey, can I invite you to my church? Can I invite you to know Jesus? And, and the, uh, a lot of times the response he gets is, well, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's really not for me. And he'll say, you don't want to go to hell, do you? He's just that blunt and that straightforward. Malachi, the prophet, paints it a little bit differently. The book of Malachi in the Old Testament, it's a book from a prophet. It's only four chapters long. And in that, in that prophecy, in that book of the Bible, you can read it today, God outlines through his prophet all the place where Israel was unfaithful. And God speaks, he says, you've been unfaithful here. And the people of Israel will respond like, what do you mean where have we been unfaithful? And God will say, look at what, how you are living, not for me, but for yourselves. And the people of Israel would say something like, well, you just haven't been very faithful to us. And God will say, well, you're wrong about that. Let me show you where I've been faithful to you. And then in the very last chapter of Malachi, God says, the day is coming of judgment. And it will be a fire. For behold, the day is coming burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that will leave them neither root nor branch. But for the people of God, he says, the remnant that remains, judgment day will not be something to fear, but something to be joyful in. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. 
God says in Malachi, he's going to send a prophet, a messenger, and then he will personally show up. And he will comfort those who are hurting and those who are lost. He will bring justice against evil. And he will restore his people forever. Uniting God's people to him forever. The day of judgment for a believer is a joyous day. That's why at the end of Revelation he says, come Lord Jesus, come. I don't want to live here anymore. But for those outside of Christ, this is a very dangerous place to be. And Wesley, in the Hark the Herald Angels Sing, he quotes Malachi in that third line. Let me just read that for you. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more should die, born to rouse the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Wesley is uniting the first coming with the second coming. For the people of God, it's joyous, but he quotes Malachi, which is a judgment scripture. The people outside of God, it will be misery. So we have a choice today. As long as you have today, you can choose Christ. The band is, is going to come back out and we are going to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We're going to have another opportunity to worship. And now that we know what we are singing, we'll be able to lift not only our voices, some of us with a joyful noise, but we'll also be able to know how we are glorifying God and how we are giving Him praise that Jesus' arrival means we glorify Him because we, we have figured out he is for anyone. So if you walked in here today and you were feeling lowly or you were feeling down or you were feeling depressed, I think I need to tell the band to come back out. Oh, here they come. If you were feeling lowly or depressed, I, I want to remind you, and this song will remind you, Jesus is for you. He, is, he has come, he has arrived to save the lost. And if you feel like, man, I, I don't even know where I can go turn to God and worship Him. You can worship Him anywhere. Today we're going to do it together as a group singing His praise. We hope you have enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, talk to, or maybe you just want more information about our church, be sure to fill out a Connect card so we can reach out and help you take your next best step. Thanks again for joining, and we will see you back here next time.